It would be unfair to say that Apocalypse is my favorite X-Men villain, because they are all great. Magneto, Mr. Sinister, the Juggernaut, oh, Juggernaut, we'll get to you someday. But there is something special about Apocalypse. He's so powerful and single-minded that he almost lands in a class with Thanos. If Apocalypse is firing on all cylinders, it takes every hero and villain putting aside their differences and working together to stop him. Apocalypse is an event, and at least for me, X-Men Apocalypse was not. Not. And while there were plenty of issues with the film, this costume, these sets, the worst Stan Lee cameo ever made. I mean, they're supposed to come in a fun scene, not the most serious scene in the movie. But besides all that, my biggest issue comes from Apocalypse's horsemen, the four generals Apocalypse recruits to further his goals. And we had an opportunity for something really cool that could have set up a great premise for this movie and built some of our new characters up for future sequels. So, if I am making one small change to X-Men Apocalypse that would make a huge difference for the overall movie, it's this. Apocalypse should be able to recruit horsemen against their will. Now, this isn't unprecedented. In X-Men Apocalypse, he convinces all four horsemen to join him willingly. But in the comics, it's about 50-50. A lot of the time, Apocalypse will take a mutant who lost their powers or who wants revenge and give him even stronger powers and the opportunity to get said revenge. However, if that won't work, Apocalypse will capture and brainwash a mutant he deems valuable. And sometimes it's a mix of both. He takes advantage of a mutant and then brainwashes them. Mutants like Sunfire, Polaris, and even Wolverine were horsemen against their will at one time or another. So how does this concept of brainwashed horsemen improve the movie? Well, I'm going to go through an alternate version of X-Men Apocalypse, pretty much the whole movie. A little light on details, but to give you an idea of how this movie would have benefited from this change. And sometimes I'm going to dive deep into what some specific changes would have meant to the film. So, the story starts about the same. Apocalypse wakes up. Cyclops is brought to the X-Mansion where he meets the other kids. I want to establish his character as less of kind of a nerd and more of a quarterback. Not a jock necessarily, but let's have his first scene be during the middle of a big game, and he's good at what he does, leading a team. He has to leave the game, he goes to the locker room, and then his mutant powers develop and he does an optic blast that ruins the game. Havoc brings him to the X-Mansion, he meets the other kids. At the same time, Apocalypse finds Storm in the streets. He realizes, oh, this is another mutant. He saves her from the thugs. Storm picks Apocalypse Apocalypse back to her place as a thank you. Then Apocalypse does some weird stuff. He mind melds with the television to learn how the world has changed since he was entombed. This is where he sees the footage of Magneto from the end of Days of Future Past. The difference in this scene is this time Storm realizes that Apocalypse is weird. He might be insane and she just leaves. She does not join the team. One of my problems with the Horsemen in X-Men Apocalypse is that mutants like Storm, Angel, and even Psylocke all willingly join Apocalypse's team. Even though in the future, those mutants should be heroes. They're not traditionally bad guys, but after what Apocalypse does in the movie and how many millions of people must die, it makes Storm kind of irredeemable. Like it's weird that she's just back with the X-Men at the end of the movie without any real consequences, even though she joined up with Apocalypse on her own volition. I have the same problem with Magneto. At the end of the movie, him and Charles have their little handshake. Oh, old friend, when will you learn? Even though Magneto was responsible for the deaths of tens of millions of people. In this version, if he's brave, brainwashed, at least he doesn't have to feel guilty. We can make him a relatable and sympathetic character in the future. So Storm realizes Apocalypse is a problem. She gets out of there. She doesn't really have anyone to call, but she does keep an eye on Apocalypse. Besides that, though, she's not going to be involved in the beginning bit of the movie. And now, because he saw Magneto on TV, Apocalypse seeks out Magneto as his first horseman. And in this movie, Magneto isn't working at a steel mill. He's building Genosha. In the comics, Genosha is a country run by mutants. Magneto is sometimes in charge of it, kind of a mutant safe ground where mutants are free to do their own thing. And considering how the character of Magneto has progressed, I feel like this is the logical next step for him. Magneto in this movie does not have a wife and child. Don't get me wrong, I think that part of the movie is very well acted. Michael Fassbender is a great actor, and he could act the hell out of a My Wife and Child are Dead plot. But besides that performance, I don't understand why they put that plot line in the movie. Not only does it pad the runtime, but more importantly, it is completely unnecessary. In the end of Days of Future Past, Magneto fails his assassination attempt and leaves, but there's no indication that he's changed. He's the same Magneto that wants to make the world safe for mutants through violence. The fact that X-Men Apocalypse sets up this family for Magneto, then kills them just to give him motivation that he already seems to have had at the end of Days of Future Past is pointless. And you could say, well, Magneto losing his family is necessary so that Quicksilver being his new family makes a difference. That would be true. But in these movies, Magneto's always been motivated 
by family loss. His mom was killed by Shaw in the beginning of first class. We don't need another family loss to motivate Magneto, so we're just getting rid of that. So Apocalypse finds Magneto, he tells him, My child, I need your help to save all of mutant kind. Come with me. Magneto doesn't want to work with him, he's doing his own thing, it's going pretty well. So maybe this can be a little, hey, fuck off line. But then, Apocalypse uses his powers to brainwash Magneto. Apocalypse takes the brainwashed Magneto to Egypt. He asks Magneto, where can I find more powerful mutants? And brainwashed Magneto says, you wouldn't believe it, but most of them live together at a school in upstate New York. And Apocalypse upgrades Magneto's powers, but in this movie, it's a process. It takes a little while, like Magneto has to recover from it. So Apocalypse goes to the X-Mansion alone. He teleports to the X-Mansion, where he finds these guys. Professor X, Moira, Havoc, Mystique, and Beast. And this is exactly what Apocalypse needs. Three mutants that can be his horsemen, and the one mutant that he can mind meld with and do the body swap. Apocalypse has relatively the same goals in this movie, and he still wants to get Professor X's power so he can take over the world. First, Apocalypse knocks out Moira. Professor X tries to mind crush Apocalypse, but it doesn't work, and the Professor faints. Then Mystique, Beast, and Havoc all get to have a fight with Apocalypse. This will be useful. This fight will demonstrate what Apocalypse can do. In the movies, Apocalypse doesn't really have a concise power set. He can heal really well. He seems to have the power to manipulate sand. He can teleport. He's some sort of telepath. He can switch bodies, although that power may come from the gold bit of the pyramid. He can augment powers. He can make clothing. And I don't have a problem with him doing those things in this movie, but I think we should examine Apocalypse's best power from the comics, which is complete control over his body on a molecular level, which means Apocalypse can grow and shrink at will. He can turn parts of his body into weapons like guns or shields. He can make himself denser. It's really cool. The closest thing I can compare it to is either a Sandman or, more recently, Iron Man's armor from Avengers Infinity War. So we have that fight. Havoc shoots a blast at Apocalypse. Apocalypse turns his arm into a shield, blocks the blast, then reflects it back at Havoc. Havoc's down. Mystique flips in, throws a punch, but Apocalypse turns his other arm into a hammer and knocks her out. Mystique is done. Beast picks up, like, a really heavy container and tosses it over at Apocalypse. But then Apocalypse makes his body dense, and the container does nothing. It just bounces off. Then he turns his hand into a laser gun and shoots Beast. Beast is down. Now we have a good demonstration of what Apocalypse's powers are, and Apocalypse has beaten all of the original X-Men, which sets up how much of a threat he is in the rest of the movie. So Apocalypse takes Havoc, Beast, and Mystique, as well as Professor X, back to Egypt. Moira wakes up and she realizes what's going on. I don't love the exploding X-Mansion sequence for reasons I'll get to later. I think it kind of exists because it's cool looking, and the movie has been light on action sequences up until that point. But because we have this short Apocalypse fight in the basement, I don't think we need it. Let's say Quicksilver just shows up, Cyclops and the guys get back from the mall, and they find the other four characters are missing. Moira explains what's going on, and she decides to call an ally of hers, William Stryker. Now, Stryker is not pure evil in this version of the continuity yet. He's clearly doing messed up experiments, but it's nothing like the Stryker we met in X2, or even Origins Wolverine. And he's a smart guy, so if Moira calls him and says, hey, the most powerful mutant is about to do something really bad in Egypt. I need you to help me, and I think these mutants that I'm working with can help. Stryker will say, yeah, okay, let's come up with a plan and we'll work together. At the same time, Apocalypse starts working on augmenting his new horsemen. New Mystique can transform into animals or liquid or even swarms of animals. And you may realize at this point, hey, this sounds a lot like another X-Men thing. It does. I'm basing a lot of this off of the Apocalypse episodes from X-Men Evolution, a great X-Men cartoon from the 2000s. It's one of the most well-put-together, simple, but also fun Apocalypse storylines I've ever seen. There's nothing wrong with borrowing what works from another medium, especially since it's safe to assume at least 95% of the audience hasn't even seen this episode. So, Mystique can transform into anything. She also has a healing factor. Magneto is also even stronger. And his new costume has no helmet, since Apocalypse needs to maintain a constant psychic link with his horsemen. Beast's upgrade is fun. Beast is gonna turn even more beasty. He's getting darker purple fur. He's getting the classic Beast haircut, bigger teeth. Basically, this Beast is turning into a big purple werewolf, which means he's pretty much going to be a character from the comics called Dark Beast. It's a completely different version of Beast from a timeline where Apocalypse took over the world. Hank McCoy is a mad scientist who works with Mr. Sinister and does experiments on mutants. And since we're probably never going to actually use that version of Beast, let's take this opportunity to co-opt the fun elements of his character design. And because he's such a monster and he's got even more hair than usual, his costume is just going to be the Speedo, which is his traditional costume in a lot of the comics. They haven't done that yet, which I understand, but I think it would be weird if this werewolf was also wearing, like, a shirt. And then, finally, Havoc. He's gonna have his powers upgraded so that he can shoot 
blasts out of his hands, like he usually can in the comics. Alex does this in the movies a little bit, but now it's way more powerful and precise. Also, we're going to use this opportunity to give him a costume that's closer to his costume from the comics. It's one of the silly ones, but I think it could look cool on screen. So Stryker takes everyone to Alkali Lake, and he tells the mutants, Okay, so I'm going to take you guys to Egypt to deal with Apocalypse. I have a helicopter, and I have battle suits that Magneto won't be able to control because they don't have any metal in them. And then Moira asks, well, do you have anything or anyone that can help us? And Stryker says, well, I'm working on this experiment. See, I'm augmenting a mutant with a really strong healing factor. Moira says, oh, that's great. Stryker says, well, there's a problem. His bones are covered with adamantium, the strongest metal on Earth, and Magneto can control metal. So I think sending this mutant would make him more of a liability than an asset. Also, he's a little difficult to control. So no Wolverine in this movie. I think his cameo's okay. It would definitely be the best Wolverine fight scene we've had if Logan didn't come out the next year because Logan makes it look like garbage. And it's another bit that's very unnecessary in this movie. But Stryker says, I do have something else that I think can help. So he takes everyone to a hangar, opens the hangar, and what's he got there but three new Sentinels. Because, of course, he would still have Sentinels. They're not the super evil Mystique Sentinels from Days of Future Past timeline since that timeline no longer exists, but they are upgraded. Let's say these are closer to the design from the comics in the 90s TV show. Because I don't think there's a good reason why the government wouldn't keep making Sentinels. They were already working on them in the 70s, and then a mutant nearly killed the president. And the Sentinels didn't do great against Magneto, but A, the only reason Magneto was able to beat the Sentinels was because he snuck metal into them the night before. If they just made sure he couldn't do that, the Sentinels may have been able to stop Magneto. And B, there are plenty of other mutants that the Sentinels would be great against, like Mystique or Emma Frost or Havoc. Basically, all of the mutants we've met so far would have had a really hard time with Sentinels. As long as the government makes good ones, they should be perfect for a scenario like this. So Stryker's been working on that, and he has three. Stryker sends his three Sentinels with the team, and they touch down in Egypt outside the pyramids, and they find Storm. She's been observing everything from far away. She realizes, oh, this is a problem, but she doesn't really know what to do. But once Storm sees the Sentinels and the X-Men show up, she realizes, okay, I can help these guys. She explains what Apocalypse is up to. So now we have all of our heroes in one place teaming up to fight the new horsemen, which serve a really interesting purpose. See, because we're not bothering with Wolverine and the Magneto storyline and all of the other kind of unnecessary mystique character building, we get to spend more time introducing new characters. Guys like Cyclops, Gene, and Nightcrawler are supposed to be the future of this franchise. There's no reason why the movie should contain a really unnecessary Magneto storyline when we haven't developed characters like Cyclops. Especially if we're doing Dark Phoenix next, we should spend a lot more time with new characters like Jean and a lot less time with old characters like Mystique. Speaking of Jean, this is a small thing, but we need a way to visualize her powers in this movie. Let's have fun. Let's be artistic. I want purple lines, bubbles, circles. We have too many mutants, especially her and Magneto, who just wave their hand at stuff and it moves. It's lazy. These are comic book characters. Let's have fun. Also in this version, Angel is an X-Man. I'm putting him on the good guy team. I understand the reason behind introducing Angel and X-Men Apocalypse as one of Apocalypse's horsemen. That's one of the things he's really well known for in the comics. But that's not all he's known for. I think the reason Angel turning into Apocalypse's horsemen and becoming Archangel in the comics was so interesting is because the comics spent a lot of time building up Angel as this really integral member of the X-Men. He is one of the original five X-Men. So when Apocalypse takes Angel, brainwashes him, gives him all these new powers, turns him into a villain, it's a big deal. It is not a big deal if Angel is just some guy with a perm who does cage fighting and gets drunk in a barn. And spoiler alert, I'm not going to kill Apocalypse in this movie. They're going to beat him, but he's going to stick around. So maybe in the future, after we spend more time with Angel, Apocalypse can reactivate, he can take Angel and use him as one of his horsemen. That way, it's a much more meaningful move. So the team we have right now is Moira, Three Sentinels, Cyclops, Jean, Quicksilver, Nightcrawler, Angel, Storm, and Jubilee. She'd come too, why not? And they're going to face off against the new horsemen. And the thing that's great about these new teams is we've got the students each facing off against either their heroes or mentors or family members. Makes the dynamic of the fight really interesting. Now the heroes still want to get to Apocalypse. They have to stop him from mind melding with Professor X. But they don't want to kill the people they're fighting. They want to save them. It presents a unique challenge that only brainwashed horsemen can provide. Also, this finale is our new scrubby heroes facing off against some of the most accomplished mutants of their generation. If this movie has to do one thing, it's established why our new X-Men team is special. Cyclops, Gene, Storm, Angel, Nightcrawler, and Jubilee are all core X-Men members. We need to make the case for why these characters are significant and why they matter as a team. So when they do 
do finally team up, our core X-Men are going to overcome an extremely difficult challenge. Beat a group of the world's most powerful mutants. Scott's going to come up with a plan, kind of like how Captain America does in the first Avengers. The most important thing about Scott is that he's the leader of the X-Men. Like we're establishing in those flashbacks that he's a quarterback and he's good at making plays and utilizing people's strengths. He comes up with all the nicknames on the fly because he doesn't know anyone's names. He's calling people Angel and Nightcrawler and Storm. Except Jean. She's the only person Cyclops has paid any attention to. That's why Jean Grey doesn't get a nickname. Jubilee and Storm are going to fight Mystique. They both see her as a really strong female mutant liberation role model. I don't know exactly how all these fights are going to go. I do definitely want a bit where the team members group up. And since Jubilee and Storm have never met, they try to strategize. And Jubilee's like, okay, so what are your powers? Storm says, I have complete control over the elements. What can you do? Jubilee's like, uh, I can make fireworks come out of my hands. But then later, at a critical moment during the Mystique fight, Jubilee will use her fireworks to distract Mystique, and then Storm will hit Mystique with a really big lightning bolt. That will be the bit where Jubilee proves that fireworks aren't that dumb. I mean, they're pretty dumb, but in this situation, they're cool. Nightcrawler and Angel will team up to fight Beast. I think this is an interesting pairing for a lot of reasons. Nightcrawler and Angel should have a fun rivalry. We've got an Angel and a Devil flying and teleporting or similar but different powers. Kurt is poor. Warren is rich. They play off each other really well. Also, as students, they would both A, see Beast as a mentor because he's one of the original X-Men and their teacher. But B, out of all of the mutants we've introduced in this movie, they are the three that look strange most of the time and can't do anything about it. Keep in mind, I think it's dumb that Beast has a serum that lets him look normal in these movies. It seems like mutants are pretty accepted when the movie takes place. Kurt is able to just go to the mall. There's even a deleted scene where he break dances. So Hank shouldn't have a problem looking like Beast, especially when there are students like Nightmare Nightcrawler and Angel, who Beast needs to be an example for. Nightcrawler and Angel are also the two other animally mutants. Beast is obviously a beast, kind of like a werewolf guy. Nightcrawler's got a tail and three fingers and he can climb walls. Angel's got wings. Their fight will be very physical, but the idea is that Nightcrawler and Angel are going to try to convince Beast that he's still a person and he can control his animal nature. Then we've got Quicksilver and the Sentinels fighting Magneto. This is fun because A, Quicksilver and Magneto are family, but then B, more importantly, the Sentinels get a rematch with Magneto. They're not metal sentinels. They're plastic or rubber or ceramic or something else. These sentinels and Magneto are able to have a big exciting fight in the air. And the strategy the team has come up with for beating Magneto involves the sentinels breaking through Magneto's shields. And once the shields are down, Quicksilver running in and putting the helmet back on Magneto to break Apocalypse's psychic link. Now one reason I'm not a fan of the exploding mansion scene is that it sets up Quicksilver as way too fast. He can run at super speed in super speed. I want him to be much more grounded. Let's say you can run at 100 miles per hour, or 200. Something under supersonic. This way you can't just solve every problem. He's fast, but he's not that fast. Yeah, he was super fast in Days of Future Past, but this continuity is terrible, so let's just pretend it didn't happen. Or maybe he's slower because he grew up. I don't know. Finally, Cyclops fights Havoc. I don't really have a ton of ideas for this one. It's probably just going to be both of them shooting lasers at each other, which is the most exciting thing in the world. Upgraded Havoc can also use his powers to levitate, kind of the same way Iron Man can, just by consistently firing firing down, so it'll give the fight a little diversity. And while the horsemen are distracted, Jean is going to find Professor X. And eventually the students beat the mentors, I mean the sentinels are all going to get wrecked, but everybody else is going to win, and Jean is going to find Professor X and get him out of the pyramid. And to finish the finale, everybody gets to team up to fight Apocalypse. He grows to be 40 feet tall, because why not, it's one of the most fun things about Apocalypse. Everybody shoots lasers, tries to tie him down, and eventually Jean and Professor X are able to team up and knock Apocalypse out. Then they're going to entomb Apocalypse in the pyramid. So Apocalypse is not dead, but he's trapped. And Moira and the CIA will take that golden pyramid topper thing, and put it somewhere underground in a warehouse with the Ark of the Covenant so that Apocalypse can't be reawakened. That way, if we want to in a future movie, we can bring him back. I think it's crazy that this team of X-Men on their first mission kills the most powerful mutant in existence. I feel like it really heightens to a point where they can't really fight Pyro and Toad anymore because they beat the best guy. But now look what we've done. We have a new team of X-Men. We haven't spent a lot of time with characters we already know. We're establishing a new class that's going to lead the franchise in the future. Characters like Magneto are redeemable because they weren't acting on their own free will. They were brainwashed. So Magneto and Professor X get to have that little, oh, old friend, you will never learn dialogue at the end of the movie. And it isn't weird because Magneto just killed tens of millions of people. And now the fights between the mutants and the horsemen aren't just these kind of CGI, everybody do your thing moments. They're not X-Men we barely know fighting characters characters we just met. It's new X-Men that we have spent time throughout the movie developing, fighting people 
they care about. Gives the scene both physical and emotional stakes. Oh, and also, Psylocke just isn't in this movie. I don't care. Save her for a Deadpool sequel or an X-Force movie or a Captain Britain movie. I'm really happy that Olivia Munn was so excited for this role, but we did not need her at all. So, thank you to all my patrons, you guys are the best. If you want to see your name up here, as well as get access to videos early, and all kinds of other cool stuff, throw in a buck or two at patreon.com slash nandovmovies. I really appreciate it. And speaking of other cool stuff, this week I put up the first commentary track. It happens to be commentary for X-Men Apocalypse, since it feels like I've seen that movie a hundred times. Patrons have access to it right now, so check that out. Let me know what movies you want commentary tracks for in the future. I'll be trying to make one of those every couple of weeks. I just released a new episode of the Mostly Nitpicking Podcast, where DJ and I discuss Ocean's 8. It's a lot of fun. If you're not subscribed yet, the show is called Mostly Nitpicking. It used to be called Mad Bracket Status. And every week, we pick apart a piece of pop culture. You can find it on iTunes and Stitcher and SoundCloud and all that. You can also follow the show at twitter.com slash nitpickingpod. Let me know in the comments what you thought of my changes. And comment if you've seen X-Men Evolution, the TV show. Doing this video reminded me how much I loved that show when I was growing up. And I'm wondering if everyone else liked it as much as I did. Like this video, share it with your friends, subscribe to my channel, apparently clicking a bell makes it easier to get notifications about my videos. I'm not 100% sure how that works. Here's the Patreon button again. Give some of my other videos a look. If you're a big fan of movies where Ty Sheridan wears a visor, I did a video on Ready Player One a couple weeks ago. It's pretty fun. And finally, follow me on Facebook and Twitter. I'm at Nando V Movies. That's all I've got. I'll see you next time.